right, so continuing on with chapter two, uh, we finished up talking today about mantle plumes and hot spots and how a mantle plume is kind of this um, area of heat be being driven up directly through the mantle and it breaks through the crust to create a volcano uh, that is not along a tectonic plate boundary, right? And we talked about Hawaii being a really good example of this. Uh, globally, there are a lot of hot spots, and if you look at a map of the world, um, all of these ones occurring in the oceans um, also occur with islands. And so I'm going to take a second and talk about the society islands right here, um, because they're a really interesting, interesting feature that's happened. So Hawaii has this hot spot that makes these islands, and then as those islands get eroded, uh, they turn into table mounts. And we talked about how they're seamounts first before they break through. But as soon as they break through the water, they become an island. And um, after they're eroded by wind and wave action, it kind of cuts the top off of them. And as soon as they're below sea level, they're protected. But they're now what we call table mounts because they're flat like a table. Um, and so as these things are getting pushed up, um, let's see, as these things are getting pushed up along that hot spot, um, as they continue to move outward, know that they're also kind of moving down, and so they need to be continually built in order for them to stay above the water, right? Um, this kind of continually moving down progression of, of going to lower and lower sea levels um, is a really great way to build coral reefs. So we have fringing reefs and barrier reefs and atolls that are made from these. And so when this thing is an island, like the island of Hawaii, has lots and lots of fringing reefs. Um, these are where uh, coral animals kind of latch onto that substrate. It's a nice and a happy region for them of warm, clear, nutrient-free waters um, that are not cloudy and they're able to start that reef building process. But as this island kind of slips along down into deeper and deeper water and, and maybe it gets eroded, Right? And so we no longer have this big volcano. It's getting cut off. Um, as it sinks down and down, those reefs continue to build up and up. Um, and we get what we call barrier reefs. And so these are separated from that main landmass by a lagoon. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is a really good example of this. It's, it's right off shore. Um, and then last but not least, as that island and what's now going to be a table mount continues, to go down, those coral animals are building on top of each other, um, and we get basically um, just this kind of circular reef pattern where it used to be surrounding an island, um, and we call that an atoll. And the reefs continue to grow even after that landmass is submerged, and they just kind of start building on top of one another. You can see how those coral animals are, are getting thicker and thicker and taller and taller so that they can stay at that nice, happy level for coral. Uh, Bora Bora is a really great example of an atoll. So you can see where this volcanic island um, used to be and is subsiding, right? And then all around it are what used to be fringing reefs and barrier reefs and have now become an atoll because they are so separated from that volcanic island. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef is a really good example. And I'm going to use the Great Barrier Reef as a platform to talk about how we also now know that plates move. So um, we'll talk in a minute about the history, but this is a really good example. The Australian plate is moving um, northwest, and as it does so, uh, this is the Australian plate, there we go. As it does so, it's moving into warmer and warmer waters. So um, what used to be just on the threshold of happy coral warm water level um, 30 million years ago is now much, much higher, and that coral is still happy. Uh, but as the Australian plate continues to move up, that Great Barrier Reef is able to expand uh, downward as it moves up. And so as new parts of the continent pass that Tropic of Capricorn into the tropical region, um, then we begin to see reef development down and down and down. And so the oldest parts of the Great Barrier Reef are way up here. And the youngest parts of the reef are down here and, and currently being built right along that tropical latitude, 30 degrees south. Right. Um, today we know that plates move. Right. We've placed satellite receivers on all of these things, and we can see the net direction and movement of the plates. 
right? Generally, the Pacific Plate is moving northwest. Um, very generally, Africa, uh, the African Plate is moving east. Uh, the Indian Plate is moving northeast, right? And then um, the color of these arrows indicates how fast they're moving. And so what I want you to do is take a second and look and see um, which plate is moving the fastest based on this scale. Well, and so based on this scale, what we see in millimeters per year, and so remember, a millimeter is about the thickness of a fingernail. Um, in millimeters per year, what plates are moving the fastest? And as I look, I see that this dark purple indicates moving the fastest. That's 70 to 77 millimeters a year. Uh, you can imagine that as about 7 millimeters a year, so 7 pinky fingers lined up. Um, so we see that the Pacific Plate and those Hawaiian Islands are moving and growing. Australia is moving pretty fast. And what else? The Nazca Plate is moving pretty fast. That's where uh, the Galapagos Islands are a little hot spot out here off of South America. And so um, not all plate movement is, is created equal. When I told you the Atlantic is growing, that's actually one of the slower moving once the North American plate is moving away here and the Eurasian plate moving away, African plate moving away, but all generally um, pretty slowly. Okay. Um, so today we know that plates move, but this wasn't always the case. Um, Alfred Wagner is a name that I want you to know. Um, he was a German geophysicist and he was the one that first proposed the idea of continental drift, what we now today call plate tectonics. And he proposed this in 1912, really early on. He based his, um, his ideas off of the shape of the continents. By looking at a map of the world, he said, well, you know, it looks like South America pretty much fits into um, that little cove of Africa. And that North America maybe could have could have attached on to Europe. And um, you know, maybe Australia was, was up in the Arabian Sea now. And so just by looking at a map, he described uh, Pangaea, the supercontinent that long, long ago, um, all of the world's land masses were this one supercontinent. Um, when he presented this idea in 1912, he was completely mocked in the scientific community. Nobody believed him. They thought he was full of malarkey. Um, and he says... You know, and so here's a couple of, of quotes against uh, this. It says, if we are to believe in Wagner's hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learned in the past 70 years and start all over again. Um, and further discussion of it merely encumbers the literature and befogs the mind of fellow students. And so people were saying this is so preposterous. Um, it would be like saying that everything that you've learned in your intro biology class was wrong. And this is a crazy idea, and we can't teach it, so let's just throw it out. And they did. Um, and he continued to gather evidence to support his theory. Ultimately, he was never recognized in his life for his work. Um, but I do want you to know he's supporting evidence. So Wagner's supporting evidence, first and foremost, was a continental fit. All the continents fit together, and it just, I mean, it looks like a puzzle that's been taken apart. And so that was his first kind of guess. Um, but then when people laughed him off the face of science, he continued to uh, collect evidence. He collected evidence in rocks and fossils. Um, the rocks that he found showed that the shorelines of the continents had similar rocks. And so he would look in the Appalachian Mountains and in European mountains, and he would find similar rocks of similar ages. Um, he would also see evidence of glacial activity, like ice uh, ice activity, in what are now tropical islands. And that tells him that, you know, these are tropical now, but at one time they must have been somewhere else. Uh, he would see fossil evidence that tropical fossils are found in Arctic areas. Um, for instance, down in the Arctic, we are finding uh, palm trees and corals and seashells from when it was not in a cold region of the world. Um, we find corals now in cold regions of the world. And then um, beyond just those, like, hmm, that's an odd animal for this place, things, uh, Mesosaurus fossils. These are an example of a fossil that's found in both South America 
and Africa and the southern portions of it. And so uh, these Mesosaurus fossils, you know, it's really unlikely that we would have the exact same animal develop on two continents that are so far apart. And so finding examples of um, plants and animals across what is now the Atlantic Ocean is, is a really big deal. They were the exact same and in the same kind of rocks, which is an idea that those continents used to be together. And so he had rock evidence. He had fossil evidence. There was continental fit, right, um, that suggested this as well. And this is what he proposed, that South America was right next to Africa and that North America was right next to Eurasia um, uh, with Australia fitting in down here. Now, what we see is that India kind of moves up to Eurasia, Australia moves this way. Um, there was this rift valley developing here, which would become the Atlantic Ocean, and here, and here. There we go. Um, and so he would see the rock matches, right? That the rocks in the Appalachian Mountains and the Caledonian Mountains are the same kinds of rocks, and that these formed when these were together. Right? They're this one big continental, continental, converging plate uh, creation of mountains. Right? He saw glacial activity in what are now warm places, and so South America, Africa, India, and Australia all have evidence of glaciation, um, which suggested to him that these were in a much colder region of the world. So we've got mountains and glacial activity in what are now warm places, very, very strange. Uh, and these gave him the clues about what fit together. And then last but not least, the Mesosaurus are these big fossils that we find in South America and Africa, um, the exact same animal. And it's incredibly unlikely that those developed independently of one another into the exact same animal. So again, suggesting that they, they occurred on a continent that was together. Um, the failure of Wagner's hypothesis, I mean, he had all this really great evidence and people still laughed him out of town. Um, ultimately, the failure of his whole hypothesis was that he couldn't explain how this was happening. He couldn't explain the mechanism behind continental drifts. And they would say, oh yeah, Alfred, all the continents used to be like this. Well, how'd they get to where they are today? And he couldn't answer that, right? And, and, and because of that, because he couldn't tell them how it happened, um, they completely dismissed his theory. Um, he passed away in 1930 without any recognition of that. It wasn't until 1960, after World War II, um, or I'm sorry, it wasn't until right after World War II that evidence began to be collected, and then finally in the 60s, um, the theory of plate tectonics was, was created as a whole. Um, Harry Hess, another name that I want you to know, is responsible for the revival of the theory of continental drift. So he was a World War II submarine captain, and they would use their radar or soundings to map um, the ocean floor. And so he realized when they were doing soundings looking for other U-boats that they were also mapping the ocean floor. And he saw some really interesting things about there. Um, he realized that in the middle of the Atlantic, there's this huge mountain range that goes up, and then there's a little dip in the middle, and it goes up again, and then back down into the abyss. And he said, hmm, that's really odd. That looks like a lot a lot like a valley, right, down in the ocean floor. Um, so he actually hypothesized ocean floor spreading and mid-ocean ridges and mantle convection cells in 1960. So he's the one that gave the how to continental drift. He answered that how. He said there's this big ridge in the middle of the ocean um, where mantle activity is coming up and creating new crust and this is what's happening. That's why the Atlantic Ocean is getting bitter. It explains why the continents are there now. And he proposed mantle convection cells as the as the mechanism behind that. Right. So in the 1960s, Edward Bullard, another scientist, um, actually used a computer model to jigsaw Pangea back together a little bit. For the continental fit, one of the problems that Alfred Wagner had 
was that the continents didn't fit perfectly together. And so what Edward did is he extended the margins of the continents to a depth of 2,000 meters, which included, included the continental shelves of those continents. Once he did that, he realized um, that this is what gave Pangea a perfect fit, that in the past perhaps sea levels had uh, risen and fallen such that that depth of what is now 2,000 meters underwater might have once upon a time been above land. Um, polar wandering is another really good piece of evidence that kind of contributed to our understanding of, um, of continental drift and of plate tectonics. So what we see is that the um, actual magnetic north pole, right, that thing that gives us the declination on nautical charts, the actual magnetic north pole uh, has wandered over time, and it, it's not always been by the geographic north pole at what we consider to be zero degrees. Um, it, it changes all the time. Um, and so with this, what we get is that as rocks are forming in the ocean, they record kind of the history of, of where this magnetic north pole used to be. And about every 250,000 years or so, um, our Earth experiences a magnetic reversal, and I'm about to tell you how we know this. Um, but what we consider as normal today has a magnetic south at geographic north pole, and a magnetic north pole at our geographic south pole. But again, uh, we have records in the rocks that about every 250,000 years, um, our magnetic field is exactly the opposite. And so if we were around while a magnetic reversal happened, uh, suddenly all compasses would point towards the south pole uh, instead of the north pole. Okay? Um, what we see is called paleomagnetism. And so paleomagnetism is just, uh, paleo means old. And as rocks form, um, they kind of form these tiny little bar magnets inside of them. And so as um, magnetite, which is a mineral, cools, um, it orients itself in such a way as to become this little magnetized piece of mineral that points directly at Earth's magnetic field. But once it's cooled and once it's formed into a rock, um, it doesn't change direction. And so there's a magnetic reversal. It's not like this suddenly orients itself um, towards the new magnetic pole. It's fixed it where the magne magnetic pole was when that rock uh, turned into a rock, from liquid rock to, to solid rock. Um, in 1963, Frederick Vine um, and Drummold Matthews used magnetic striping in the sea floor to explain sea floor spreading. And so magnetic striping in the sea floor is at the mid-ocean ridge where this uh, liquid or plastic rock is coming up and forming new rock. Um, as that cools off, it orients itself towards the North Pole. But what we see as we go out into these older rocks is that some are saying North Pole is down here, right? And we call these magnetic reversals. Um, these are periods where the Earth's magnetic field was flipped. And I want to give you an idea of how all this happens. So I've got this, um, this little animation to do that. And what we see is that we've got a spreading center, a uh, divergent boundary, or something like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And it is, um, that mantle plume is coming up and kind of pushing this lithosphere up. Um, and you can see that here, and it's it's spreading out and creating a new ocean floor. Um, I'm going to slow this spreading down a little bit. Uh, maybe not that slow. There we go. And I want to note that um, currently in this magnetic floor, um, the magnetic field of the Earth is as we experience it today. But if I reverse this magnetic field, we get a region where rocks are cooling and saying that magnetic uh, north is at geographic north. And then if I flip it again, say it's been 250,000 years, I start to get this kind of striped pattern on the ocean floor as I change the poles, as I reverse them. And so what we see is that about every 250,000 years on the ocean floor, we get a reversal, right? And that's on average. Um, it's not consistently every 250,000 years. Some are a little bit longer than others. 
And then there are periods where it might reverse very quickly. And we get shorter stripes and then maybe some longer ones. Right? Um, but this is all recorded in the history of the ocean floor. So when uh, in 1963 Frederick and Drummond began mapping the magnetic anomalies of the seafloor, this further supported seafloor spreading um, and further supported um, Harry Hess's idea of, of plate tectonics. And then the age of the ocean floor. So if the ocean floor is spreading from the middle, um, in the Atlantic at least, then where would you expect to find the newest rocks? Well, right in the middle of the ocean where they're being made. And then the oldest rocks would be towards the edge of the continents. And we also find this to be true, that when we date those rocks, the newest ones are occurring along these spreading centers. Um, so right down the middle of the Atlantic. And then we've got spreading centers all over the world. We've got some over here, right, where we find very, very young rocks. And then the oldest rocks in the world are 144 to 208 million years old. And they're right along the edges of these continents from when they used to be together. Um, and that's the oldest rocks on the sea floor, by the way, not the oldest rocks that we have on Earth. Um, the other thing that we find is that earthquakes and volcanoes are intimately related with, um, with plate tectonics. And so this is a map showing the volcanoes of the world in the upper left and earthquakes of the world in the lower, lower right. And what we see is that these are all happening right along those margins of the plates, of the tectonic plates. It's almost a map of, of the plates themselves. And so finally, with all of this evidence um, and a new mechanism and a, and a way to explain how, um, acceptance of the comprehensive theory was developed in the 1960s. And so when I told you guys that I had a professor that remembered <laughs> these debates, these arguments, um, he was around in the 60s for these scientists saying, like, no way, there's no way this happens. Um, but ultimately, it came around to being accepted, and, and it's now taught widely. Mm. And so to give you an idea of how this comprehensive um, kind of theory plays out, there is Pangea, which Wagner proposed uh, the idea for. But we know today, along with the advances in the study of geology, that um, this slowly separated. It wasn't like it all separated at once. And so we began to see um, these separating first, um, separating more, separating more. And then finally, in the last 65 million years, we began to see the Atlantic Ocean uh, truly, truly forming. Now, the rocks we see in Rangeley, and I'll tell you this too, are mostly uh, Cretaceous rocks. They're about 65 million years old. And so they formed when Rangeley was woo, right about where it is now, but um, under much different circumstances. All right.